Hi hey everyone, this is Mike from the Comic Book Trove. I'm back today with another review. Today I'm going to take a look at the Batman by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo Omnibus Volume 1. Now, uh, this is, you know, pretty iconic run, despite the fact it's it's relatively modern. This was part of DC's uh, New 52 relaunch from back in 2011. And out of all of the different series that made up the New 52, consistently this Batman run tends to be ranked as, if not the best, slash most popular, then one of the best. It tends to be, uh, if you look it up, if you take the time to look up kind of ranking, listed rankings of um, best new 52 runs, this one always seems to come in near the top for most people. So, you know, with that in mind, I thought, uh, let's take a look at the book and see whether or not I agree with that, really, see and share my thoughts. So just to show off, you know, the dust jacket, you know, the book itself, um, this, you get the cover, that's issue number one. And the dust jacket itself is this kind of matte finish, um, but the lettering of Batman on the spine uh, and the front, that is glossy. So it kind of uh, shows it off quite nicely. Um, the spine, you know, you're very much in your face. You're not going to confuse who this book is about. And then the back, you get this, what I think is a really cool, obviously very creepy image of the Joker with his severed face, which is part of the Death of the Family storyline, which is collected in here. And I'll discuss that more as we get to that point of the book. Now, the contents, you're getting just over the first half of this overall run. So you get uh, Batman issues 0 to 33, 23.2, and annuals 1 and 2. So there will be a second volume, which should round out this run and finish it all off. That is set to come out in November of this year, at this point in time, as long as it doesn't get delayed, postponed. Fingers crossed it doesn't. Uh, the book itself, uh, on the actual the hardcover underneath the dust jacket, uh, you get this kind of really very colourful uh, spread image, of uh, which is from Batman Zero Year, which is one of the other stories collected in here. Um, and I think it's quite an interesting contrast to the dust jacket, which is all kind of black, dark grey, dark colours. Um, to have this kind of bright yellow and blue image under here, it's uh, it's quite the difference. Um, and I like the actual artwork itself, the homage to uh, Detective, uh, Detective Comics 27, Batman's first appearance. Cool stuff. Um, now in the book itself... Just before I go into this, I will say, by the way, uh, spoiler alert, because I'm going to discuss this book in a fair amount of detail. I'm going to show off a lot of the artwork and discuss some key plot points. So if you don't want to hear any spoilers, you don't want the run to be ruined for you, then just fair warning, you might want to come back and check this out another time. Um, but yeah, if you have read it, of course, or if you're just not bothered about spoilers, then obviously feel free to stick around and uh, I'll go through it, share my thoughts now. First thing I just want to mention, which might seem like a minor point, um, but in a DC book, frankly, you never really know what you're going to get with this. Now, there is a contents page in here. Sometimes DC do not include a contents page. Sometimes they do put a contents page in, but they don't put page numbers in, so it's almost useless. Uh, in this book, you'd get both a contents page and there are page numbers throughout as well. Not on every single page, but uh, I think most of the pages do. So. This is an instance of a contents page that's actually useful. Um, again, you wouldn't think I would have to mention that, but DC are inconsistent. Um, the covers as well, this is issue one, and uh, I will also point out they are Virgin covers. And, uh, you know, I said before with the Justice League, again, same with this as that book, there's no kind of indication anywhere on the cover itself, on the page, what issue you are reading. So you get the actual cover, the virgin cover minus all the text and everything and then on the reverse side you tend to get a kind of black and white version of the same cover which is really nice to see but it does mean that you unless you are constantly referring back to the contents page if you're like me and you haven't memorized what every cover of every image uh, every issue i mean is you're gonna forget which issue you're reading not that it necessarily matters to me personally because you're reading through this as one long story basically but it would be nice to have an indication of which issue you're up to on the cover itself. But that's just me anyway. So, without any further ado, let's talk about the material now. This is broken up into three main story arcs. It starts off with The Court of Owls, then you've got Death of the Family, and finally Zero Year. Now these first 12 issues or so make up The Court of Owls. Now I will say that this, for me, 
straight away this court of owls story that you get right from the beginning is the best of the stories in here i think and uh from what i know of the run afterwards i think this is quite possibly the best story in the entire run so i suppose you can make up your own mind as to whether that's a good thing to start off with the best and and then have story arcs that don't quite reach that standard but it's just that this is a really really interesting concept so what you basically get in your first issue is just kind of an introduction to the Batman of the New 52 now. Unlike other characters, when the New 52 started, a lot of characters were completely rebooted with entirely new origin stories and started from the very beginning again. Batman was a bit of an exception because he didn't. He, for the most part, kept a lot of the key parts of his continuity, but it was sort of condensed. So at this point in time, Bruce Wayne is supposed to have been Batman for about six years which is fine uh, and that means that in those six years some key events like nightfall and you know they're supposed to have still happened at some point in the past uh, and all the robins have come and gone but um, when you think about it in any amount of detail it doesn't really make a lot of sense for batman to have done everything that he's supposed to have done and to have hired and trained dick grayson jason todd tim drake Barbara Gordon as Batgirl uh, and you know have them all kind of move on and become who they are now so to have you know Dick Grayson as Nightwing for example to have gone through that many sidekicks in that short a span of time it just doesn't quite add up to me I don't know I mean I suppose you could technically make it work but anyway it would have had to just be with each one for like at most like 18 months each um, I don't know it doesn't seem quite right to me but anyway so the Court of Owls are a secret society who have been kind of hidden and pulling the strings of power in Gotham for, well, a very long time, for decades, hundreds of years even. Um, and uh, Batman is basically completely sceptical of their existence. He's adamant, in fact, that they don't exist because he claims if they did exist, he would know because he's Batman and he knows Gotham City better than anyone else. Uh, but then, of course, they turn out to be real. And they have these assassins, these guys called Talons, who are <laughs> very tough to kill. Um, and they kind of get sent out. In this case, they get sent after Bruce Wayne. They attack him, try to kill him. Um, and they're kind of like enhanced with some kind of... Uh, I can't remember. Some kind of formula that basically makes them kind of regenerate any injuries. So, the, you know, most injuries, they will just rapidly heal from and they're otherwise highly trained killers so they're tough to deal with um and yeah so batman then kind of is forced to realize that the court of owls is real and he has to try and find them and uh and take them out and it's just really cool it's, it's a really nice addition to the kind of batman mythology you know um when you get a character like Batman who's been around as long as he has since the late 30s, it can be genuinely difficult, I think, to introduce completely sort of original ideas and concepts to his overall world and still have the stories be really good. So to get that here right from the very beginning, with the Court of Owls being a genuinely very interesting addition, in my opinion, uh, to have this secret society that's just operating from the shadows. And it's dealt with really well because Batman is very much out of his depth. He, he doesn't know who these people are. He doesn't really know who he's dealing with at first. Um, and there's this really cool issue where Batman gets captured um, and locked in some kind of underground labyrinth, which is all happening here. Um, and he's kind of down there and he's looking completely uh, exhausted, um, disheveled. And as the issue goes on, he just kind of looks worse and worse. Like it's the psychological, physical torment that he's going through down here in the dark, trying to find his way out. He's starting to hallucinate. The artwork starts to do this kind of rotating thing. So it goes, it starts to go you know, sideways, it goes upside down, so that you as the reader kind of feel disoriented as Batman himself feels. Um, it's a nice little gimmick bit of a difficult thing to read in an omnibus of this size and you've got to flip this thing around but uh, it's still really cool and this is you know quite a violent series you know as well I'll say right now so there's 
It doesn't really shy away from violence. It can be quite graphic, um, quite mature. But I think what I like about this run, and I was, I was reading it, as I was reading it, I was trying to think to myself, what is it exactly that differentiates this run from other Batman stories that I've read? And I think for the most part, it's the character of, of Batman slash Bruce Wayne. He is his own worst enemy in here. And I'm not saying that that's never been explored before, but his kind of overconfidence, his arrogance, is you know continually getting him into more trouble than he, than he needs to be in you know so he, he completely underestimates the court of owls he doesn't even think that they exist um he does the same thing later with the joker and death of the family he underestimates the joker he, he's, he, he thinks that he knows him well enough to be able to deal with, any, with pretty much anything he throws at him and, and he's wrong about that um so yeah it's this kind of batman who he's far from perfect you know as a character in here he, he is very flawed because of his own personality. And I think that is one of the best strengths of the series, is how Batman himself is actually written as a character by Scott Snyder. Uh, but there's this cool scene, Batman finally manages to get out of that labyrinth. He is, you know, near death. He's absolutely wrecked. Um, and he gets back into the cave, Alfred helps him in. And uh, Alfred's got one of these Talons costumes uh, well, I think it's one of the Talons himself. It's kind of, they've got him frozen. Um, I think it's revealed that pretty much the only way to take these people out is to store them at extremely cold temperatures so their bodies can't regenerate. Um, but Batman sees this kind of incapacitated Talon and he absolutely freaks out and nearly loses his mind. And you don't see that very often, so that's a pretty cool little moment, you know, to see Batman terrified, because generally speaking, Batman, you know, pretty much never shows fear. Uh... But yeah, honestly, and then the story escalates to a point where the court have revealed themselves and they send all their talons out, this kind of army of assassins that they've amassed. They send them after key figures in, in Gotham, key political figures, key kind of leaders, um, and after Bruce Wayne himself. And uh, this is where it becomes a big crossover event with the other Bat Family titles. And again, that would be a common theme throughout the entire Batman run where all the other Bat titles that were going on at this time, so for example, there's Batgirl, Nightwing, uh, Red Hood and the Outlaws, Catwoman, Batman and Robin. Probably forgetting a couple of pointers, there was quite a lot of them, and they were all crossing over, so each of them had a, an issue or two where they were fighting off Talons as a result of what was happening in this story. Um, and that, again, same thought thing with uh, Death of the Family, showing the story from each of their perspectives and their titles. Um, but in here you are just getting the Batman stuff. So in a way, you're not getting the full story, but you're also getting the main story, if that makes sense. So you can read this and not be lost for the most part. There's maybe one key thing that I will mention in a little bit that could have been helpful to include in here. But really, for the most part, you can read this through from beginning to end. And it's, you know, it's new reader friendly, I would say, and it's not missing anything so substantial that you will read this and kind of be like, wait, what's going on? You know, so it's mapped really well. The content for the most part is, you know, is good. And yeah, obviously you know, the stories themselves are really cool. Uh, most of the artwork, of course, not, haven't really touched on that yet, but it's almost all by Greg Capullo, who does a great job in this series. It's some of my favorite art from any modern um, run. But he doesn't do all the artworks. There are some guest pencilers as well who appear periodically, like uh, you know, just these pages, for example. You know, this uh, is not Capullo. This is a guy called Raphael Albuquerque. Not an artist I'm really familiar with, to be honest. But it's cool. It's all right. There's no bad art in here. I'll say, you know, the Capullo stuff is the best. But even the um, the guest pencilers who show up now and then, I think, all do a really nice job as well. You also get uh, some flashbacks as well that sort of explore the history of Gotham. Uh, for example, here you're getting, uh, this is Alfred's father, who had served the Waynes before Alfred turned up. And so you kind of get some stuff from the, the Wayne family history from his perspective. So it's, it's all very cool, kind of expanding, expanding the lore of Batman in interesting ways. 
Uh, I do like when this story starts to culminate, when Batman kind of starts to get his revenge, so to speak. You know, he starts to figure out who certain member of the court, certain members of the Court of Owls are, and he's kind of tracking them down individually and scaring the crap out of them once they know that uh, he's onto them. Because that's the thing, these people are used to being in the shadows. You know, they don't face their enemies directly. They're a secret society. They're used to being, a, being in control. So when suddenly someone knows who they are, Batman in this case. I mean, Batman's the last person you want to be knocking down your door <laughs> if he's coming for you. But honestly, that's just a really, really iconic story. I think if you were gonna only read, for some reason, if you decided you're only gonna read a small part of this whole run, the Snyder Capullo run, then I would say, absolutely read those first 12 issues. I think it's the 12 issues anyway. Uh, but the full Court of Owls story anyway, really good. Top quality stuff, honestly. And then there are these kinds of backup stories um, that appear throughout here, which explore um, this character here, this girl called Harper. And she's kind of introduced, I'm pretty sure she was a new character introduced in this series. I don't think she'd appeared before, if I'm wrong on that, apologies. Um, but she's kind of a really sort of tech savvy girl. She's really good with um, machines, you know, gadgets, electronics. And she kind of takes it upon herself to start doing little bits of work here and there to assist Batman, kind of uh, covertly. She uh, she modifies the, uh, the Gotham power grid, for example, so that it kind of works in Batman's favor. I won't go into the details of it, but She's doing little things here and there that kind of work for Batman. And then ultimately, I think later during the Batman Eternal series, she became kind of a, a sort of fully fledged member of the Bat family overall. But I can't 100% remember because I haven't read Batman Eternal for a long time. But this is, um, I think this is an annual. And this is the thing, you know, this is... I think that this is a Mr. Freeze story, and I'm pretty sure it was one of the annuals, annual one, I think, but because, well, I mean, I could refer back to the contents page and double check it, but I didn't want to do that constantly as I was reading through the book. So this is where it would be useful just to have a bit of text here or there just to tell you exactly what you're reading. But as I say, it's, it's a bit of a nitpick, really. It's not essential. Uh, but anyway, this is a kind of reimagined origin for Mr. Freeze and a story featuring him where in a really interesting twist. So he is going after his frozen wife, Nora, um, in here, as he pretty much always is. He's always trying to track down his wife, trying to cure her of the rare disease that she needed to be frozen to save herself from. But there's a really good twist in the back of here. And I know I've already said spoilers, but I'll just say spoiler alert again for this because I think it's really cool. Uh, and it turns out that this is not his wife. So this woman that he won't stop talking about how much he loves her and how much he needs her to be safe and to, you know, cure her. She's not his wife. He never even knew her. In fact, she was frozen before he was even born. She was, um, he's just obsessed with her because of the fact that she's frozen, basically. It's this kind of psychological um, obsession that he has with ice and with, with things being frozen. She was just a particular case study that he came across when he was, uh, doing his doctorate and he was just obsessed with the idea of her so he's kind of in love with an idea he never actually knew her um, and I think that's a really cool revelation with how that's handled and it was an interesting twist on the uh, the Mr. Freeze story And then the next big story coming up, uh, following on from that though anyway, is the death of the family. Uh, there is just a, that was just a story there that showed a little bit of stuff from Zero Year. Zero Year kind of gets foreshadowed a little bit, and what Zero Year is, I mean I'll, I'll talk about it more when I get there, but it's, it's Batman's origin. So Zero Year refers to, um, you know, in a nutshell, the earliest time that Bruce Wayne was becoming Batman. And there was a specific year as well, a specific event, I mean, as to why it was called Zero Year, but um, it's basically a reimagined Batman origin. But here, anyway, is where the Joker turns up. He turns up in this really kind of uh, 
creepy scene. And I will say right now that this version of the Joker in this storyline in here, he's surely got to be the creepiest version of the Joker that's been in any story. It, I, he's got to be. If not for any other reason than the fact that he's, he's wearing his own severed face as a mask. Um, really unique version of the character and a genuinely interesting take on him. And he first appears in this creepy scene where he makes all the power go out in the police station. Then he's just standing there in the doorway when the emergency lights come on. And he's basically taunting all the, the cops in there. And he's sneaking up on them one by one and taking them out in the dark. Uh, and then Batman turns up and fight, you know, the lights go back on and, and everyone's been killed and Commissioner Gordon's the only one left. Uh, so that's how Joker's return is made official. Um, and yeah, it's just uh, the, the basic goal of the Joker in here, as, as much as you can ever say Joker has a goal, is that he is convinced that all of the members of the Bat family, all the various sidekicks and, and other characters who work alongside Batman are, uh, are a crutch. They're hindering him, they're making things more complicated, and he just wants it to be just him and Batman like it was right in the very beginning. So he is trying to make Batman realize that as well, kind of. You know, obviously it's a plan that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it's the Joker, so it's psychotic. Um, but again, this is a really cool story and I really liked this take of the Joker. It's genuinely quite creepy and unnerving at times, you know. Uh, and again, Bruce Wayne, Batman, he kind of underestimating the Joker because he thinks that he knows him, that he knows him well enough to be able to deal with him at least. And he gets caught off guard. Really cool image here, really like this. You know, powerful image. Creepy, scary image as well, you know. Disturbing stuff. Uh, and this story, so this started to run through all the other series as well, just like um, Court of Owls did. And what that basically was, was in each individual issue. So for example, in Batgirl, it would be a story where Joker's going after her and she has to confront him. And then same in Nightwing and, and the, all the others, you know. And again, they're not in here. So just the main Batman issues are. So you see everything from Batman's perspective. But meanwhile, I suppose you just have to know that Joker was going around and kind of terrorizing everybody else as well around this time. And then it all culminates with the uh, Batman issue 17, I think this is 17. And again, I kind of don't know that from the cover. I know that because I've read it before and this tends to appear in a lot of other collections of material from this time because all these other characters tie in. Um, yeah, so what, it's, what it is is Joker's managed to capture each of the other members of the Bat family and he's brought them all here. And he... <laughs> is suggesting that he's cut off all their faces just like he did to himself or had done to himself. But they're all fine. He didn't actually do that to them. And then uh, in the end, Batman kind of chases after Joker. Joker falls down a cavern, seemingly to his death. But of course it's Joker, so you know he's not going to be dead forever. Not really dead at all. But the, the main thing that happens here is it turns out that Batman had kept some secrets from the other Bat, uh, members of the Bat family, so about the Joker specifically. So they kind of don't trust, or at least their trust in, in Bruce is shaken as a result of this story. So I think that, that metaphorically that is the death of the family. Nobody actually dies, but the Bat family's trust in Batman fundamentally is, is shaken and therefore, you know, they're not as much of a unit not as much of a general team. Not that they're specifically a team, but you know what I mean. And then you get some uh, some more stories there with Harper. Which is called Harper Lee, I think is her full name. Yeah, so then there's around about this point, just after Death of the Family, I, you know, I mentioned one thing that happens elsewhere that isn't summarised even in here. There's not even a page of a little bit of text just to say that this had gone on in another comic. But basically, and this is a spoiler for the Batman and Robin series from the New 52, which was separate to this because there were just tons of Batman series. Um, but um, 
Batman's son, Bruce Wayne's son, Damian Wayne, who was Robin at this time, died. He died in a separate story, and obviously that's a big deal in the series. So, and it's a big deal, and it's got repercussions in the other Batman series, including the main one, this one. So there's just a point where Batman is kind of struck by grief, and you know, you know that Damien has supposedly died, but you don't know. Well, you don't even know that that's happened if you just read this. There's nothing that actually tells you that that has happened elsewhere. And I think that at the very least, if you're not going to include, you know, actual pages of excerpts from that issue, at least include a summary page, just a bit of writing that just says between these issues, you know, in Batman and Robin issue, whatever, Damien had died. So now Bruce Wayne is grieving for his son, something like that, just to give you that slight bit of context so that you're not completely confused. And as I say, it's not a total problem it's not a huge issue it's not that you can't understand the story it's just that you know when you got a book this big already might as well put in a, one extra page just to say that to give you that context it just i don't know i just like when they make the extra effort to do stuff like that and so often dc just don't put those little touches in when marvel do there's plenty of marvel books that would give you a little summary page like that dc so rarely ever seem to do it and I just can't help but think that maybe whoever's putting these collected editions for DC just doesn't think about these little details from the reading experience. I don't know. It's a little rant that I'm going on there. But uh, it's just something that occurs to me as I was reading through this. And I just wonder if it's true. But anyway, rant over. Uh, back to the story. You get a couple of issues with Clayface, which kind of give you, you know, a new version of Clayface, new a new 52 version of Clayface. Uh, then an interesting one-off story here, kind of a supernatural story with Superman making a guest appearance. Um, another guest penciler, Alex Maleve. Quite a few kind of bonus stories. I'm going to call them bonus stories. I'm sure they're just annuals or whatever they are, but um, little one-off stories in here before you get to the zero year. That story is basically covering this old woman who turned out to have been one of the first patients at Arkham Asylum before it was a, a place for the criminally insane. So it's, that's you know a story again exploring some of Batman's history in this case exploring some of Arkham Asylum's history but then you move on to Zero Year and this is a big thing that takes the rest of the book pretty much it lasts for about a 10 issues or so um, and I like that the art style in here is kind of distinctly different from the the book previously to this there's a lot more kind of color in it it just makes it look quite as i say distinctive and so yeah what this all is it's very much a kind of uh, if you think about batman year one by frank miller whereas that's quite a concise short origin story this is kind of like taking the basic principles from that story and fleshing out into a, a bigger thing so you see Bruce Wayne returning to Gotham after his years away, and uh, you know, you, as periodically through you go as you go through here, you see flashbacks as to what he was doing specifically whilst he was away, what kind of mad activities and training re regiments he was doing to get so good at fighting and fitness, etc. Um, but the main story in here, I'm not going to go into it in, in total detail because there's a lot going on in this. To be fair, but initially you start off with this gang of criminals called the Red Hood Gang. They're terrorizing Gotham and Batman, well, Bruce Wayne is, is a very, as a very kind of still inexperienced vigilante, not quite, not calling himself Batman yet at this point, but he's trying to take the Red Hood gang down and it's kind of revealed or at least hinted at that the leader of this Red Hood gang is in fact the Joker prior to him becoming the Joker. So that's going on for a while and Bruce Wayne is, you know, very much got a lot to learn. He is making mistakes and paying for them. His, his relationship with Alfred is quite interesting as well. He doesn't, he's not giving Alfred the kind of trust and friendship that their relationship generally tends to bring. So he's quite, in fact, he's quite bitter towards Alfred in uh, early on. And, but you do see their relationship develop to more of the familiar territory that you expect from their relationship. 
but uh, ultimately, you know, it takes down the Red Hood gang, and then it moves on to, like, the second key part of uh, Zero Year, which is featuring the Riddler as the main villain. He manages to take control of the city and kind of plunges it into darkness, literally, kind of switches all the power off for everything, cuts off access to the city from the outside, and threatens that if anybody tries to make it into the city to interfere with his plans, then he will blow up, I think he's going to blow up some bombs or release some gas or something. So he's effectively holding the entire city hostage. And you've got Bruce Wayne in there as Batman, you've got Commissioner Gordon, and a small group of sort of resistance fighters, really, trying to uh, bring the Riddler down from within. And this was a really good story. I'd never read this part of the run before, so prior to getting this omnibus, I'd read The Court of Owls and I'd read Death of the Family. But then for some reason, even though I'd enjoyed both those years ago when I originally read them, I'd never read on and read Zero Year and beyond. So this part of the book, this kind of second half of the book, was, was new to me this time around. And I really enjoyed it. I've got to say it was a really cool take on Batman's early years. Well, his first year, basically. And, uh, you know, just kind of showing how he became more of the Batman that we know. Cool stuff. And then as you'd expect, in the end, he uh, does manage to get the better of the Riddler. Many riddles are involved. Um, and then he takes him out in a satisfying splash page. And I tell you, by the time you get to the point where he finally beats the Riddler, you are very ready to see it, because the Riddler has been a pain in the ass up until that point. Oh, and I just want to mention as well, this really, really nice, um, well, sad, really, uh, final scene. I think this is from the final part of the Zero Year. And it's a scene where um, Alfred and Bruce are talking to each other. And Alfred reveals that uh, a woman that Bruce knew and had a bit of a romantic relationship when he was younger, prior to going away and doing all his Batman stuff, um, has kind of, she's turned up, she's there, and she's, she wants to see him if he's able to see her. And Bruce kind of says, you know, I'm not going to stop being Batman. You know, I'm not going to just settle down and have a family life. Um, and Alfred, just there's this really kind of sweet, but like bittersweet moment, really, where Alfred, well, initially it's presented as though Alfred has introduced them and they start talking to each other. And there's this really simple six panel sequence where it's like they go on the date. They have children, they have a family life, and then Bruce saying to Alfred, you know, thank you, Alfred, and Alfred, they're much older, just saying, of course, you know, as in, and then it turns out that, you know, that's obviously not real, um, and the reality is on the flip side of the page where he has to just tell her that Bruce is unfortunately busy and he's not going to be able to see her, but a really nice moment, I don't know why that kind of, I found it particularly powerful, just this little moment from Alfred's perspective of his kind of wish for Bruce Wayne, that Bruce could just live a normal life and have a family life and be happy. But in reality, of course, Bruce is effectively constantly tormenting himself and very much committed to his crusade as Batman. And, and you know, it, it makes Alfred sad. You know, it's, yeah, I don't know. Such a little moment, really, in the grand scheme of things, but one that stood out to me maybe more so than anything else in the entire book. And then at the back here, you just get literally a bonus story with uh, the Riddler. This is one of those, I think it's 23.2. And then the end is an issue that tied into Batman Eternal, which really, without the rest of Batman Eternal, that issue is pretty much meaningless, not going to lie. Uh, but then you get a variant gallery, a variant cover gallery with a lot of variant covers. And there's some really cool artwork in here, in, in these covers. It is quite nice to get so many variants in the back of a book like this. I think it's pretty much a variant for every issue collected in here. It's good stuff. And then a bit of uh, kind of original character designs and pencils, character studies from Greg Capullo. 
and there's that pencil image of that really cool page I highlighted earlier. Really, really good. Honestly, I really enjoyed the run. Um, I think it, it deserves the praise that it gets. It's not my favourite ever Batman work. You know, I still would say that, for example, I prefer the Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale work on Long Halloween and Dark Victory. I think I'd still rank that above this, but certainly this is a really good take on Batman and a really good um, modern series to read. You know, if you're wanting to read something that's probably more accessible than going back and reading stories from previous decades, uh, this is a great place to certainly start with. And, it, you know, it's very new reader friendly as well, so you don't really need to have a whole lot of knowledge of, of any Batman lore to be able to jump in and enjoy this. I'm pretty sure you could go in blind and have a good time. So overall, you know, very much a great addition to my collection and a book that I do recommend, whether you read it as an omnibus or in what other formats you can get. I think it's still readily available in trade paperback volumes as well. Um, so whatever you prefer, really. But gets a thumbs up from me anyway. So as always, guys, you know, thanks for sticking with me. It's another long one. Uh, I always appreciate anybody taking the time to watch these reviews and listen to me talk for all this time. Um, but yeah, as always, thanks again. And I'll be back again soon to discuss something else.